since I will start working, uh, talking about Gary Breedveld, um, you know, uh, it's maybe appropriate what I said, because he never studied architecture, never. And, and he became one, one of the movers of uh, modern architecture, so to speak. So I think it's time to start. It's 6.15 uh, here or 6.16. I will start to, with, uh, I have two presentations on, uh, on Gary Driedveld. Uh, he, it is his birthday today. So that's the reason why, why I chose to, to talk about him today. I have to, sorry, I have to choose um, uh, share screen. Okay, this one. This one, okay, and now we'll start from the uh, from the beginning. Okay, uh, slideshow from the beginning. So, do you see the page, Gary Driedveld, eighteen eighty eight, and so on? Yes, we do. Yes, we okay. can see. Okay, so this is the man, <laughs> Gary Driedveld. Um, you, I'm sure you know of him because of the Schroeder house, but he built other things as well, which are less known, uh, but some of them very worthy of being known. And of course, as a designer, he was, he was great. So this is the man, the furniture maker. Uh, he seems hardworking and serious, but he also has a whimsical smile on his face. And I, I think any great creator has a, child within, a playful child, and that playful child is actually the, the engine of, uh, of creativity, I think. So he, he was uh, uh, one of the, the pillars of uh, the, the artistic movement, the still uh, the other two very important ones, there were a few others, but the other two very important ones were Theo van Dersburg and Piet Mondrian, and I will talk about them today as well. Okay, I'll show some drawings now. Uh, you know, studies for the Schroeder house. It's beautiful, you know, when you do architecture or design uh, and, and conceive of, of them as, as adventures, you know, this, uh, this uh, uh, plunging into the creation of a building or a piece of furniture and uh, you take risks and you do calculations and you dream and you build. And uh, this is very nice and I, I, I am so afraid that um, often uh, you know, uh, the formal educational system is uh, too rigid and too restrictive and, and takes away some of this joy, if not all of, uh, all of it or some of it. Uh, sorry, I don't know what I did here. Okay. So essentially, he was a furniture maker. He even had a furniture uh, company before he started to, to build. But he built the Schroeder house when he was not so um, old, but he was not so young either. I don't know, around 35, 37. Uh, we'll come back to this. Um, now, the, the aesthetics of, of the steel were very much uh, concerned with uh, some kind of a cubistic interpretation of the world and uh, chromatically, uh, you know, vivacious because they use primary colors. But what is amazing in a way about um, the, the Netherlands is that they didn't have just this movement. For example, uh, simultaneous with it, simultaneous with it, there was also the School of Amsterdam, extremely interesting. And in fact, in a few days, we'll celebrate one of the bright lights of that movement, um, Pete Kramer. So uh, they were more so-called traditionally with brick, with sometimes with kind of uh, arts and crafts um, aesthetics, very interesting. And they were simultaneous. And, 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 and this only shows the complexity of this country. On one hand, you have these avant-gardists, you know, like the steel, but on the other hand, you had people who also were very, very creative, 
but they work more uh, with you know organic materials with brick with wood uh, and so on and then of course you had they had uh, the mystic uh, the mystic painter uh, Piedmont Drian, and it will be my pleasure to talk about him today because he does deserve it. He was not an architect, but he was uh, very important for this movement, they still. Now you might say these chairs are not very comfortable. It's very, <laughs> it's probably very true, but he meant them to be, uh, to, to, to be able to uh, be disassembled kind of easily and reassembled and um, so manufactured for some kind of mass pr mass production. Uh, the image on the right is from the Schroeder house. This is a museum and, and you'll see it um, uh, today too. You see, unafraid to be abstract, unafraid to use primary colors, unafraid to defragment or fragment to fragment, <laughs> better said, and then maybe defragment the cube. Uh, they love experimenting, you know. Furniture designer. Well, he has this uh, famous uh, chair, uh, red and blue, the one you see in the, um, the middle at the top. And uh, <clears throat> three years ago, when uh, the, there was uh, the, the steel uh, centennial, I launched a competition for another chair, also another so-called red and blue chair. Uh, of course, not to copy this one, but to create one kind of, you know, a, a chair that would, would connect with our time and express our time the way this chair did when it was created. I also launched a competition, and I could maybe show you some works for a new Schroeder house. We all know the Schroeder house in Utrecht by, by um, Griedveld, but across the little alley, there was a space as big or as small as the one that the uh, Schroeder house was built. And there I, I proposed to, I launched a competition to, to imagine another so-called Schroeder house on the occasion of the centennial. In other words, to connect with a, with a famous house and then betray it, betray it in the sense to create a house that is kind of inspired by the Schroeder house, but belongs to our time. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, asserts its time uh, distinct, distinctively. Even this chair is very interesting, you know, it's it's very simple, but I think it's effective and I think it works. It seems solid, but it's playful and it's not a, an accident, so to speak, that uh, uh, that famous book, uh, Homo Ludens, which means the playing human being, was published in the Netherlands and the author, Johan Huizinko, was also Dutch. And his um, theory was that uh, the act of creation must be by necessity also uh, an act of playfulness. But he made the distinction between game and play. The game is frivolous. The game doesn't create culture. But through playing in a certain way, you could create culture. And that form of playing is a superior form of, uh, of, uh, of uh, being ludic, so to speak, and I see we, I see this here. You know, I, I you you could say these chairs are for children. Not necessarily; they could also be for adults, childlike adults. Yeah, this is the famous. Uh, this is a masterpiece of modern design, the red and blue chair by Gary Driedveld. It's an armchair and uh, it's abstracted. I think it's very nice. It's nice to look at, maybe not so nice to sit on, but that's okay. Another uh, chair by him. But you can see the level of abstraction is, is, is kind of high. And also you see the, 
you see this chair is uh, is uh, has an ingenuity in the sense that uh, you can you can easily understand how it was made assembled from these uh, segments from these parts and in a very you know playful way architecture or design are nice if 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 you do them in this way you know creatively joyously adventurously otherwise they they could be a bore you know if you just follow the you know the the common uh, road and uh, you know we, it can be extremely, extremely tiring, I think. Anyway, um, yeah, this is not a chair, but it's still a piece of furniture done by him. The zigzag chair, what an idea, you know, to make a zigzag chair. <laughs> yes. A chair could be, uh, you know, a ludic object, you know, again, maybe it's not very comfortable, but uh, when you think about the, the wooden boxes that uh, Le Corbusier was sitting on in, in his Le Cabanon in his later years, and he was not any longer a young man, and yet he sat on literally on wooden boxes. So the obsession with the comfort and the comfortability it's really problematic. After all, if we are happy, if you are creative, you are if you are adventurous, you find joy in your work. It almost doesn't matter where you sit. It's only the bored being, you know, the one who looks at the TV, extremely bored and depressed, who needs an extremely comfortable sofa. You don't need an extremely comfortable sofa if you are creative and you are alive and you are you are genuinely involved and intensely involved with, with, uh, with, with the essence of life in a way. Do you think Antoni Gaudi, because we'll talk about him tomorrow, had comfort inside Sagrada Familia where he lived? No way. Brancusi, the great sculptor Brancusi, he lived on a piece of wood, you know, it's like he slept on a door all his life. Now you could say these artists were, or architects uh, were a little bit masochistic. I don't know, maybe, but uh, no, because I think when you are truly happy, because you you create something new and, and and your life is exciting in that sense, you don't care too much about comfort, you know. Uh, like uh, Philip Johnson used to say in his older age, and he lived a long life. He said, "Well." I never had a vacation. I don't like vacations. So if I can be, build another skyscraper, why lay on a, on a, on a chair at the beach? And it's true. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think that if you lead a very uh, interesting and rich creative life, you don't even need vacations. No, because the vacation in its uh, spirit is present in your life exactly when you work because because the joy of discovery uh, you know makes every day kind of adventurous and kind of vacation like but unfortunately in modern societies most people have five, five very boring and tedious, uh, tedious uh, days and then in the weekends they explode in the sense that you know Everybody is looking for the weekend, you know, to get rid of the of the gray working days and the heavy working days. But the problem is, while you do not have joy when you work, in your weekends you don't you don't create anything. So I think the challenge is to work and play at the same time simultaneously. Otherwise, if you just dedicate two days with ple to pleasure and five days to pain. <laughs> You will be a schismatic human being, like, like most of us these days. Look at this object. It's, you could say it's almost a toy for, for, uh, for young children. It's not. <laughs> it's even some kind of a chair, I guess. Very interesting, but you can, you can tell that this is a child conceiving uh, childlike, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, furniture creations that uh, you wonder, are they made, made for children or for adults or what's going on here? The furniture as a toy, you know, why not? Yes, the famous zigzag uh, zigzag chair. Oh, it's well crafted, even though it, it looks very simple, but uh, he was a furniture designer after all. So, Gary Dreadwell, of course, whoever wrote this forgot to use a capital R, it's okay. Dutch furniture designer and architect, one of the principal members of the steel, famous for his red and blue chair. We know this by now. The chair was designed for the Riedveld Schroeder House, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this chair was made exact, exactly in the year when the, the, the founding of the steel happened. That's when the movement uh, was born. Another interesting chair. Now, I don't know if this is by him, but it could have been. Uh, he has a middle name, Thomas. This I, uh, I forgot, actually. So you see in the lower left corner, so the Schroeder table, in the, up, the upper right corner, the zigzag chair, uh, later on done. They're very pure, and uh, you know, yes, the functionalist could find uh, problems with them, but uh, it's okay. They are famous pieces of furniture and they deserve to be because they, they, they bring you joy. Not so much when you sit on them or use them as seats, seatings, but uh, when you look at them. But look at, at this picture, uh, this uh, furniture too, it's, it's not bad. It's, uh, I like it. it it's, it's interesting and it functions, I'm convinced. So he was one of the, we know this by now, uh, principal of members of the Dutch artistic movement called the Steel, along with Theo van Duisburg and Piet Mondrian. And uh, he came a little late, uh, that's why the, it is written 1919. The movement kind of started in 1917. Um, so I will talk in detail about Theo van Duisburg and Piet Mondrian as well, by the way of Riedveld. Now, we see this pavilion, the Riedveld Pavilion at the Kröller Müller Sculpture Garden, which, if I understood correctly, was destroyed and, and rebuilt, or was damaged, and, uh, and uh, they had to uh, refurbish it. But it's, it's his building. It is his building, but it was rebuilt, just as the uh, Barcelona Pavilion in Barcelona by Mies was, was rebuilt. It's different. It has some similarities with the building by Miss, but it is different. I think it's very nice. And this is a very important museum. This building is less well known compared to the Schroeder house, but it is a very important building by him as well. You see many of the important buildings in, in, in the modern movement don't actually employ finishes. There are no finishes here. It's the uh, building material that is used in a certain way, but is not covered by, I don't know, uh, layers of I don't know what in order to hide what they are. No, they are displayed exactly as they are. Oh, 
Not bad. Again, it's almost like, uh, you know, uh, playing with, uh, with cubes. You can see how it is done. As Louis Kahn said, you know, that a good work should show how it was built. He, that's why he admired the ruins, because in, in his uh, conception, Louis Kahn thought that uh, a ruin is, 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 is good because uh, it, it tells you how a thing was, was built. But uh, other people think otherwise. For example, Jean Nouvel thinks that uh, today's technology is not to, is 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 is, be is better if it is hidden and and not uh, displaying its uh, specific role and how it is. He was referring particularly to structures. Now the famous Villa Schroeder. Um, which I learned kind of recently that, in fact, in this in famous villa, the, the very creative part is on the second floor, and that the first floor is kind of conventional. So yes, on the second floor, uh, everything moves. You, you, can, uh, you, you have these partitions uh, divide and subdivide the space uh, in, in various ways. In such a building, you don't actually need to hang pictures on the walls, you know, because the whole the whole building or the whole space is kind of an artwork. So, of course, you could do it, but it's not it's not crucial. It's not vital. From what I understood, the, the, the daughter of the owner, uh, Gary Riedveld, worked together with the owner, um, you know, in the, in the making of the building. And the daughter of the owner also became an architect because she was, um, you know, seduced by the, you know, by, by what she saw with her own eyes, the, the, the conceiving of this building and then the building of it. As uh, uh, Albert Einstein said, creativity is contagious, pass it on. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's almost a wishful thinking. I, uh, I don't know, maybe it is, hopefully it is, but uh, I actually like to think that yes, it is, but I, 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 I receive so many proofs that it's not so contagious, as contagious as I would like it to be. But I, I, I continue to, to, to hope that Einstein's thought uh, is, is correct. Yeah, everything moves, everything opens. It's, it's, it's a very interesting space. And I actually think in a way it's more interesting than Villa Savoie. Because also employs, uh, you know, courageous colors, if I can call them so, you know, primary colors, and it has this uh, mobility that Villa Savoie, for, for example, doesn't have. And although um, Le Corbusier was himself also a painter, that's a white house, you know, uh, here... Uh, uh, Riedveld was not a painter, but uh, his building is more colorful than uh, than Villa Savoie. Nineteen twenty-four. So is he considered a plastic architect? Why plastic? Geometric, grid-like, breaks, cubic units, private, public spaces, free-flowing interior with partitions that open and close. So he was 36 years old, um, I think, uh, yeah, when, when he built it. I don't even know how he was allowed to build because he didn't have a license. He was not an architect. I almost wish he, he, he did that beautiful, um, you know, leafless tree, um, himself. I, I like that tree there, but of course it wasn't him who did it, but someone else. 
So the Riedberg Schroeder house in Utrecht was commissioned by Ms. True Schroeder Schroeder. It was built in 1924. It was a manifesto of the ideas of the of the distilled group of artists and architects in the Netherlands in 1920s. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It differs from other significant buildings of the early modern movement, such as the Villa Savoy, we just talked about it, uh, the Tugendhat, Tugendhat uh, uh, Villa by Miss van der Rohe. Unfortunately, because of the fame of this building, the other buildings built by uh, Rietveld are much less known. And uh, even I, I struggled and I didn't finish. I, I have a second PowerPoint presentation with other buildings by him. Unfortunately, it's not finished that uh, I, I, I had no time, but you will see other buildings uh, designed and built by Rietveld. So compositions generally uh, emphasize the separation of planes. The application of primary colors and the special issue, well, I don't know who wrote this, but uh, it, yes, there are separations, but there is also the possibility to, to delete the separation. Window sizes vary on an individual building. Uh, the, maybe there was a student here who wrote this. I found it on, on, on the internet. Uh, the English is a little problematic. They may be arranged in patterns or one unit on a large wall. I don't know. Anyway, um, okay, this was the first presentation, Gary Lidfeld. Now I will show you the second one, uh, which shows different buildings by him. Uh, okay, so we start from the first slide. Hello, Mr. Lidfeld, we are back at it. This is, I like this picture of him, young and intense and serious, I like him. Now, uh, we, I'm not going back to this house because we already uh, discussed it. Then, the, unfortunately, this language, because what happens, and, and this is a, a suggestion to you, if you search for materials about, uh, you know, certain architects or artists or writers or whatever, Usually on Wikipedia, the site that is in English is less developed than the site that is in the language of the country that person belonged to. So I went here to Wikipedia, the Dutch Wikipedia, and I found indeed a richer materials, but I didn't have the time in all cases to translate um, what it meant. Um, you know, it's, it, this is Dutch, but in a way it's interesting, even, even if you don't understand. In this case, we understand because we see garage, but, um, uh, e even if you don't understand, uh, the fact that the language is in the, uh, you know, is, is belong to the, the, the person we are, we are talking about, I think it creates a certain atmosphere that maybe, maybe we are not supposed to understand everything. This is what I try to do. I can't even read it. To me, it seems a complicated language. Uh, and uh, anyway, this one also, I couldn't find the pictures of. I couldn't find pictures of this one, but I think of this one a uh, house. Uh, now, this next one. So sorry, the, this is a large presentation which I didn't finish, but I was able to 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 yeah to kind of develop certain entries within it. Uh, <laughs> I didn't expect to be such so long until we arrived there. I don't understand. Something is wrong here. Ah, okay. So this is a. Uh, uh, Bioscope is a building built in 1936 in Utrecht. And this is a, a kind of, a, now that I think of it, it makes me think a little bit of that library shown by, uh, uh, by our guests yesterday, you know, that uh, micro library, because of the playfulness of the facade, this skin of the facade, where here, um, Riedveld worked with letters while they worked, you remember, with 010101. That's the building in the center. Now it is occupied by the <laughs> world famous company Esprit. Um, so it was done in 1936, so you know, 80, 84 years ago.
Now this is a, a, a vacation little house. It's kind of funny, looks funny. It looks very, uh, somehow not tall, sufficiently tall. It's a cheap house, it's a vacation house. But uh, it seems it functions and you know, it, it is a little strange in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so low high, but um, height, but uh, you know, it's a little house, a little hut in the forest. With kind of an emphatic entrance because of that sloping canopy. Now we have, um, he also built a pavilion in Venice, at the biennial uh, in Venice, for the biennial in Venice in 1954. So that pavilion is still uh, alive today. So if you go to the Venice Biennial, you can see wherever the Dutch pavilion is, the Dutch uh, you know, participation is the building that uh, Gary Ridwell designed. And this is the building. Um, it's not bad. Uh, he designed several uh, pavilions also in Belgium, and we'll see that one as well. Also, he designed also uh, uh, blocks of flats, apartment buildings, kind of social housing. And I admire this. Here you have a, you know, a member of the artistic elite, an architectural elite, but he also allocated time to, to think about those less privileged and, and build for them. And that's, I think, not only very nice, but also necessary. And uh, I, I, I'm a, a little unhappy that some of the stars of today don't do that. Some of them, some do, some don't. Well, this is a recent picture. I don't know if he conceived the ceiling just in this way. This is the building. It's very simple, but the entrance is kind of interesting with those rotated, that rotated platform and with the three steps. Maybe it's not a masterpiece, but uh, this uh, square on the left side kind of, for my taste, needs something, but maybe not. I don't know. To me, it's a little bit too, too plain, but uh, it is an interesting building, simple as it is. This is the plan. It's a square, actually, divided in four or three, but it's a square with a little addition on the right. Gary Ridbelt. Now, uh, this is uh, that uh, pavilion that we saw in the Kröller Müller Museum um, in the previous presentation. You see here a new picture or another picture of the same building. And this one as well. Now in a beautiful forest surrounded by uh, good artworks, uh, you know, <laughs> what could you ask for more? But, you know, um, he, cre he created the conditions for himself to be in such a company, you know, because, uh, you know, if you achieve success and you do not betray your ideas and you have integrity, then sooner or later some, you know, the right commissions come to you, hopefully, and, and so on. It's still a modern building, you know, kind of cubistic. Is the aesthetics of the still? Uh, yeah. This is a bus stop. Um, again, it seems kind of not tall enough. I don't know exactly why I feel so. Uh, it, it's something about the proportions, just like that little house in the in the um, you know that vacation house that we saw uh, before. <laughs> almost feel as no, but if the man gets up, he almost hits uh, the no. He doesn't, but I guess he loved horizontality, just like Frank Lloyd Wright. So no, it's a bus stop. Uh, now we see uh, a clock, an urban clock. Uh, 
because he was himself a very accomplished and skillful designer. Not bad. Now, a weaving mill, he did something like this too, and it was refurbished recently. This one is also interesting, you know, a little kind of a little repetitive, but uh, it's not bad. I mean, it's an industrial building, but it's still architecture. And there are some refined things happening here, you know, even, even this Cartesian structure is, is uh, I would say that um, the words of Boileau apply, l'esprit de finesse is united with l'esprit de geometry, uh, the geometric spirit is connected with the spirit of, with the fine spirit or finery or the finesse. It's not a brutal geometry. It is, it is sensitively, uh, sensitive, sensitively done. I mean, there is a certain elegance here. You can tell this is a man with a plastic sense. With a, I would call him an artist, if you want. But he was also a craftsman. And I repeat what I said previously uh, several times that I totally agree with Walter Gropius who said that the artist and the craftsman have something in common and that is craft. They are both craftsmen. The only difference is that the artist is an exalted craftsman. And in the case of Riedveld that exaltation is uh, rather reticent or uh, you know subdued but it exists. And, and that is actually the, the expression of that playfulness uh, connected with, uh, with creativity. Now this is, uh, I don't know, it's something about Aldo van Eyck, another very important uh, Dutch architect, uh, but because I do not know Dutch and I had no time to translate, I don't know what the re reference to Aldo van Eyck is here. I have a presentation uh, somewhere on Aldo van Eyck too. I, I, I lose some, some of these presentations, but I have on almost any architect, uh, almost from any, any period, especially from modernity. It's a house. And this is the plan, kind of interesting. And it is, uh, it is well designed. I mean, if you look at the plan, it does function very well. And it has this uh, you know, kind of strange, um, courtyard with that uh, circular enclosure, but it is nice. Uh, of course, that car would seem inappropriate for for a North American. First of all, a North American would need at least three cars, and maybe not just North Americans these days. Many people uh, are not happy, certainly not with such a small little car as the one shown on this plan uh, by Riedwell. That's uh, all my, my new school uh, car. It's not, uh, <laughs> it's not up to date at all. Although it should be, because first of all, I think we need more bicycles than cars. And if we are to have cars, let's make them as small as possible. But that's not uh, what general population uh, desires. I like this plan. I, I like this house. And nature, as always, is magnificent. So it seems Joie de Vivre is not far away from us human beings. It's uh, achievable. For some people, it is. For other people, not so much. Now we see, uh, I think, the Yes, I wanted to arrive here, the housing blocks. I admire him very much, as I mentioned, that he also did uh, uh, blocks of flats. And they seem to be for, uh, you know, so-called common people. They seem to be kind of social housing. First, I discovered this picture and I, I, I like it. Uh, I mean, you know, they are apartment uh, buildings, but I don't know, it's something about 
this picture, uh, you know, small and gray and black as it is, uh, that attracts my attention. And then I saw other pictures. Um, I have also a few with a higher resolution. I mean, look, it's not just the stair, which is impeccably done, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, sculptural and it's simple, and uh, you even wonder why it's just there. Uh, maybe it's a special apartment or uh, there is a uh, long uh, um, exterior corridor which gives access to the buildings on that floor, the second floor, but it's very nice, you know, and it's not, uh, you know, in, in other countries you might need to enclose it and provide some vestibule and all kinds of securities. No, here it is open towards, very much open towards the past, towards, uh, yeah, and uh, you, you know, it, it is a civilized society and kind of homogeneous and uh, it works. That accident that the stair uh, represents is a welcome addition to the to the building. But yes, these are modest buildings built after the war, but but they are architecture. You can see the plan. You know, maybe it's nothing spectacular, but uh, it, it doesn't have to be spectacular to be good. And you can see the facade is not so banal and so simple as might appear at the first sight. And it has a certain complexity and even uh, touches of uh, ornamentation, if I can call it so. Okay, this is the pavilion in Brussels, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Belgium. Uh, well, Corbusier built a spectacular one together with a very interesting man, uh, Yanis Xenakis, who was also a composer of avant-garde music. But uh, it was destroyed. I don't have pictures with it, but you can search on the web the Philips Pavilion by Le Corbusier. It was at this uh, World's Fair in 1958 in, uh, in Belgium, in Brussels, or Bruxelles. Okay, um, there's another building by him. Um, you, can, you can recognize already kind of the aesthetics of Gary Riedberg. Although other architects work in similar ways, but you know, for the caref careful observer, you could uh, discern some some traces of personality here that are discreetly but uh, uh, discreetly present, but uh, still uh, maybe easily identifiable for the so-called connoisseur. <laughs> I'm not claiming I'm a connoisseur, no. In fact, with these presentations, I do not want so much to transmit information, but inspiration. Because information today, anybody can find on the web. But the idea is to transform that information into some kind of impetus to become creative ourselves. That, that's the purpose of, of what I try to do here at, uh, at this hour every day. Uh, Another villa in a large open space. But if you look at, uh, at the Netherlands from the plain, as maybe some of you did uh, see this, you know, it's almost like a continuous city, you know. But uh, here, surprisingly, or at least at the time when it was built, uh, there was a large space around it. I don't know if any longer it is like this. Uh, 
unless it's for a king or a queen, I don't know. Everything is large and big here and immense, you know, the, 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 the sky, the landscape, and the house, I don't know, even the house probably is large. Okay, now we have another, this is a school. Uh, I would say it's a modest school. Yes, it is a modest school, but uh, it is by Riedveld. Now we find uh, another pavilion, rather big. I don't know, it's that it was done for a company. Um, and you can see already his aesthetics, you know, influenced by the steel, uh, uh, uses uh, primary colors, but with some discretion and then uh, you know he has uh, graphic uh, elements you know black uh, or white uh, in this case the divisions the mountains of the of the windows and then the the edges of uh, the horizontal slabs it's nice i think it's nice and the bicycles are nice too and here we have a civilized country that it tells us use the bicycles, they don't pollute the air. But some countries still want very much cars, cars, and again cars. And it's very possible that Frampton, for example, was right, the car destroyed the city. And he was, he's not the only one who said so. Too many cars uh, do destroy the city and they do destroy the, the air. You probably know, but when the pandemic started in China and for uh, two months or so, the, they, they were not allowed to move, there were uh, significant changes in the quality of the, of the, uh, the oxygen, the, the air in China. The, the, the skies were clearer. I read articles about this, that in just two weeks, two, two months, uh, in, 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 in in the areas where uh, circulation um, and mobility by vehicles was, was uh, interdicted, um, there was a dramatic change. So yeah, the cars uh, create pollution. It's obvious, everybody knows it, yet we run like, like crazy to the four cardinal points. Here is the man with something is said here on this poster in, 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 in Dutch from 2018. Handsome and deterrent, you see it's, he's a willful man, a f willful artist who succeeded. Now what is here, uh, we have more pictures. Yeah, I think we have this house, which is less colorful, but it has a certain, you know, the proportions and a certain playfulness with the volumes. It's not spectacular. And I, I like this fact that, you know, the, the Dutch still are, um, uh, capable to, to balance a sense of exuberance with a sense of uh, measure and, and, and even reticence. Okay, so I, I ended with uh, Gary Riedvel. Let's uh, wish him a happy birthday on his birthday. And now I will show you uh, two more uh, PowerPoint presentations about his partners in charge, so to speak, of the, the steel movement. There were a few more other people, a few more people uh, involved, but they are the most important: Theo van Dusburg and uh, Piet Mondrian. Uh, nobody asked me to do this. This is more like a bonus, but I like to surprise myself first, and not first uh, to surprise you first, and then myself by doing something that. Uh, but anyway, nobody is asking me to do this these presentations at uh, 3 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time is my way of, of connecting with a significant past and paying homage to uh, to important moments in art and in uh, architecture. Okay, so we start with Theo van Dersburg, who died rather young. He was not even 50, 40 something, 46, 48 when he died. And he was, I think, a, a, a difficult man. Uh, yeah, he was 48 when he died in 1931. He looks like a difficult man. He reminds me a little bit of Adolf Loos somehow through his uh, dramatic persona and uh, positioning, <laughs> not to speak about his dramatic uh, cap or 
have, well, you know, artists and artists and architects and, uh, you know, designers that they are, they are, they could be eccentric, <laughs> exotic, so to speak. He smoked like many other, you know, uh, creative people. He liked hats like other creative people, you know, among them, of course, um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, but even uh, for Vizier in his later years, he wouldn't take his hat off for anything in the world. <laughs> even when he was in the company of uh, monks and, uh, you know, talking about Ronchamp or La Tourette, he always had his car, uh, head covered, even when he was indoors. Kind of strange. I wouldn't play games with this man. He looks a little bit like, uh, I don't know. Um, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to, to be his enemy. He would probably <laughs> uh, ravage me, destroy me. I know he had conflicts at, uh, at the Bauhaus with Walter Gropius. And uh, yeah, I can see why. <laughs> I think he was very confident and uh, he had some reasons to be confident, but maybe he was overconfident. I don't know. Drawings. Drawings. He was a painter, actually. He didn't study architecture either. These, uh, the, the Riedveld and Theo van Duisburg were, you know, uh, amateurs in the field of architecture. But these amateurs built buildings that are UNESCO heritage uh, sites. Essentially, they were artists. You know. Even Riedveld who was an artist. Uh, but a uh, furniture maker, but essentially an artist. And look here, the sketches by uh, Theo van Dersburg, an artist, an artist. <laughs> Principles of neoplastic art, of course, Theo van Dersburg. Now studies, you could say it's almost the plan of a house, but I don't know if he designed really a house here. He designed the, the pattern of a possible painting, I guess. Is it a self-portrait? Maybe. An animal, a cow maybe. Paintings. Well, stained glass windows. Painting, very much similar to certain paintings by Piet Mondrian. And after this presentation, we will look at Piet Mondrian. What a painter, I love Mondrian. Mondrian, who apparently was so timid, he was, I read, he, he wouldn't dance with a woman for anything in the world. He loved music, but he wouldn't dance. Uh, uh, he, interesting man. With problems, of course, like other interesting men. Interesting men have problems, you know. But who doesn't have problems? This one also kind of similar to certain rotated paintings by Piet Mondrian. Now, apparently, this movement is still, uh, you know, was uh, uh, in existence between 1917 and 1931. Uh, but, uh, you know, its influence lasted beyond 1931, of course. Architecture. Well, some drawings first, and then we'll see what he built. This axonometric drawing reminds us, of course, of uh, what we saw uh, done by Riedveld. It is not a, an accident that they were actually, uh, you know, involved with the same artistic movement. We'll also see a few architectures of today that are kind of, um, you know, extensions of the De Stil movement, but buildings built, uh, you know, 60, 70 years later. It's interesting, you know, you have a painter who wants to build and the painter has a different kind of imagining a building and uh, sometimes with a freedom that we do not have. That's why I'm saying, you know, there is a risk that the school of architecture in the name of reality 
And yes, there are good intentions there, but those good intentions could actually create some fear in the future architect because you are taught certain things that block actually your creativity. While a painter, uh, you know, doesn't have the inhibitions which are a result of a conventional formal education. Café Lobet in Strasbourg, which is a famous work of his, and is still uh, alive. Um, let me see if I have uh, the, the pictures, don't have a resolution uh, that is satisfying, but I think I have other pictures that are uh, larger, at least. Again, we contemplate the power of, of the diagonals and the power of colors. It's an abstract work but it also functions, uh, you, you see it. It's almost like one of his paintings in three dimensions. And it is in Strasbourg. He also built a house for himself in, uh, in France, near Paris, we'll see it. Not bad. This is the building outside. You wouldn't expect <laughs> to find inside what we just saw. Axonometric uh, drawings, uh, details. This is a graphic work, uh, you know, connected with the design and the creation of this cafe. So he was considered and he's considered an avant-garde apostle, so a prophet, an avant-garde prophet. <laughs> you know, these prophets, they are beautifully, um, you know, limited, but uh, it's okay, you know, they're, they're not necessarily wise people, no. <laughs> I would say quite the opposite. They are, they are not wise, but, but exactly because they are, to an extent, ignorant, they, they, uh, they have that faith in, in, in their gestures, which makes them maybe convincing uh, for a certain period of time or for, for certain people. One thing they have in common, they want to change the world. They are not happy with the way things are, so they want to change the world according to their whims and their uh, beliefs and their faith. Maison van Duisburg in Meudon in France, that's his own house. Uh, he was doing well for an experimental avant-garde uh, apostle. Uh, he was doing well. Uh, he even had time to, 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 to purchase a piano. Uh, windows are large. Uh, well, you know, this is, of course, uh, many years after he died, but uh, the spaces are generous. So the artist would enjoy himself. Now, the, the picture of the, of, of, of the time, I mean, originally, maybe the building didn't look too spectacular, or I don't know, it's such a difference between what we see here and, uh, well, maybe it's not such a big difference. The color is makes all the difference. But when the when when we look at this grayness, uh, maybe it's not so different from this. Maybe it's a foundation. Now is that the Theo van Duisburg Foundation, and he built it for. Uh, this is the back. This is the the atelier of the of the of the prophet of the apostle where the the. <laughs> where the prophet painted. Not bad, he had a good life, the prophet actually. Towards the street, mm, you wouldn't really say that this is the house of a, of a, of a prophet, of a, an avant-garde prophet, but uh, it is. 
and it must be nice. It must be nice. The, the the table covered by the second floor, and you know, with the nature around it. I don't know who lives there now, but uh, it's not. Uh, it's not him, and it's not his wife, and uh, who knows? Somebody rented it, I imagine, or maybe the people working for the foundation. Atelier van Dersburg in Meudon. So this is his house near Paris. Okay, I finished with Theo van Dersburg and wait, wait a minute, something is strange here. I, Mondrian was supposed to be on, on this presentation. I'm confused. Could it be that, just a second, I, I, I ask for forgiveness. I am tired because this uh, marathon, <laughs> Sometimes I I I, uh, I have second thoughts about uh, its uh, its uh, effects on me. I'm surprised. Well, I, I, maybe I have two presentations to Van Dersburg, and one has the Mondrian on it. I'm confused. If not, I'll be forced to end here. Now I have another little one with uh, after the steel. But I really wanted to show you Mondrian. Let me let me search here because I love Mondrian and I love to talk about Mondrian. Pete Mondrian. Okay, I see plenty of things here. Ah, it's a different one. I'm so happy that I found it because I really wanted to to have this chance to talk about Mondrian because, as I said, Mondrian and the Theo van Dersburg and Gary Rydberg, they were the pillars of the steel. And uh, uh, he deserves to be talked about, although it is not his birthday. But I, uh, I get inspired by Riedveld's birthday. So he was a little older than Riedveld, was born in 1886 or 1888 anyway. Um, so he lived for 72 years. Yeah, 28 by 44, yeah, 72. Great painter, I love Pete Mondrian, and he was a mystic. And he was at first in his, you know, you probably know his uh, abstract paintings with the vertical and the horizontal or, or with the rotated canvas. But initially, he was a figurative painter who was obsessed almost by flowers and, and churches. And this is this in itself is worth talking about. Why would Pete Mondrian be so interested in flowers and churches? But if you think about what a flower is and what a church is, then you understand. Is the work, they are both connected with divinity, with God. Flowers are beautiful celebrations of nature that grow towards sky, the sky, towards light, towards the sun, and, and, uh, and, and bloom towards that mystery that we call in various ways. And then the cathedral or the church does the same thing. This is in his older age. I, I don't know about that, about that mustache, but you can tell he's a serious man. And he was indeed a very serious man. I like this picture of him. He's a man, uh, almost makes me think a little bit of Lucian, our painter. Uh, maybe he had some suffering, but he's a man who went through the trials and errors of spirituality. That, and his, he, his paintings move towards that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, going beyond the accidents of eph ephemerality. He searched for, for what was essential. Interesting man, interesting painter. Look at him now. Now, some think that a, a, an artist is some kind of a criminal in disguise. And maybe you can see that in him. In what sense criminal? In the sense that you, you first actually start with yourself. You kill yourself in the sense that you give everything you have for your artwork. You empty yourself of your own life so that your canvas becomes alive or your sculpture becomes alive or your building becomes alive. It's a great effort and sometimes and maybe oftentimes society doesn't support you. So it requires truly an exhaustion, uh, an utter exhaustion. And you kind of see it here. I, I love Mondrian. 
I, I could almost understand why he, he didn't dance, you know. He, he was sublimating his own sensuality uh, through his painting, through his art. He became very successful, of course. His suffering became, uh, uh, was compensated by the joy of doing great artworks and, and succeeding. Not everybody had this chance, although maybe other people, you know, made equally uh, significant efforts. It is said that he had, when he lived in Paris, he had two rooms in his apartment. One room was exactly like his uh, paintings from his later years, very ordered with verticals and horizontals. But then he had another room, which was a total mess. And in a way, this shows the, the dichotomy between the two sides of any human being, artist or not artist, that we all have, I think, this kind of duality. On one hand, we, we long for order, for discipline, and on the other hand, uh, you know, we are, we are ex, we are, we are, you know, uh, a mess. So this is the room that was kind of like his paintings. And look at his posture too, you know, he's very vertical, he's, uh, he's just straight, you know, he's like... <laughs> uh, but I understood, as I said, that there, there is another room, there was another room very, very, very different. Now, he lived in various places, so maybe this was not true in all, uh, all, all circumstances. can almost tell that this is a man with spiritual aspirations. It's like, uh, you know, the, a monk living here. Early paintings. I love these early paintings. Look what he painted. He painted, you know, trees and uh, silhouettes of trees and the sun, I guess, and uh, again, trees. Um, and, and his trees are actually, uh, you know, at times a little bit contorted and uh, you, you see the church in the background and the trees uh, in the front and, uh, you know, two different worlds in a way. The church is uh, geometrical and solid, although it is just sketched, but the trees are kind of, uh, you know, first of all, they don't have too many leaves, if at all, and uh, you, you can tell that he was haunted, the church. The church and uh, some some suggestion of uh, sunlight. Another tree. Actually, his later paintings derived their verticals and horizontals from these trees, and you can see the tree is approximating itself into some kind of a future development that uh, renounced uh, some of the so-called details or accidents and became. Uh, in the end, uh, celebrations of purity uh, reduced aesthetically to exclusively, you know, most of the time, two lines, a vertical and a horizontal. He, the foliage of the tree is now abstracted into an artwork like this one, or like this one. So it's not any longer the tree, it's not the, the, the foliage of the tree, but but that's where it came from, and, and, and it moves towards what we will arrive at. Again, the tree, I mean, this is a tree that probably would have moved even Van Gogh. You know, it's an expressionistic, tormented tree. It is a tree that, 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 that uh, shows uh, angst, shows anxiety. Please remember this image when we arrive at his Boogie Woogie series that he painted in New York and it's such a transformation. It is almost unbelievable that the same artist painted this tree, this tormented and tormenting tree, and then he arrived at that uh, 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 pictorial jazz uh, that the Boogie Woogie series is and which is truly very joyous and, and, and uh, it is abstracted, but very, very joyous houses. 
another kind of a, a silhouette of a church but this painting was not finished another church so he had some kind of connection with architecture he didn't build though he didn't he, he didn't uh, exercise uh, himself in, in in the field of architecture at all but you can you always see you know trees and houses or churches in his early works again a house and trees another cathedral or, or church and the dutch do have i have some books uh, with the dutch uh, villages and, and 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 towns they have countless beautiful churches and cathedrals mostly built in, in with brick great great buildings that are not uh, present in the histories of architecture but it's, it's a great great treasure the architectonic uh, treasure again that uh, tormented and tormenting tree now here we see the silhouette of the church and uh, fragmenting itself towards some kind of uh, an allusion to what was to come now this is an even earlier painting much earlier it's very figurative i imagine he was around 20 when he did this but always he is interested not just in uh, landscapes but landscapes in which there is also the work of man more many times a house and, and, and the church the cathedral the church so i think mondrian although he became one of the the pillars of modernity in, in painting he was a, a i think he he was i think he was I, I think he had faith i think he believed and why why else would he be so interested to paint uh, you know countless paintings of churches and trees again and uh, yeah it moves me because I see again this great country that, that has uh, an incredible appetite for uh, invention and uh, avant-garde uh, gestures and at the same time is anchored in, in, uh, in the traditions of its own, uh, uh, its own culture, you know, of its own uh, environment, ambiance, you know. But the tree again is, is kind of a little bit uh, uh, unsettling so very different from the geometry of the roofs and the you know of, of, of the of the town or village uh, in the background trees church church now this is uh, we are we are stepping into into abstraction here is the the, the atelier of, of the artist and his eyeglasses uh, you know on, on the the table is gone now this uh, this is already uh, the mondrian that we know and you can see you know where he started from and where he arrived so it took him some time to move away from figurative art towards abstract art but there is still a continuity you can see the transformation stages this is one of the paintings, Boogie Woogie, that I was telling you about, that was done in New York. He lived also in his later years in New York. And they are called Broadway Boogie Woogie. Uh, and what a difference, no, from, from that anxious tree that, that we saw. Now, what, I am a little bit confused because when I saw paintings by him, I actually saw how he was approximating the right position of a vertical and the right position of a horizontal. And he had very slight uh, uh, differences between traces, the way you, you, you could see in his paintings, traces of the previous uh, line uh, until he found the, the perfect positioning I thought he didn't use a T-square when he designed this, and although it's kind of hard to believe because the lines are straight, but when I saw the paintings, you know, in so-called reality, I, I, I had the feeling he, maybe he just traced a, a thin line and then manually he painted these horizontals and verticals, countless variations. 
trying to find the perfect equilibrium between vertical and horizontal. So his struggle was towards abstraction, towards essence. I don't know if you know, but this great poet whom I admire very much, Charles Baudelaire, who was also an excellent uh, art critic, he said uh, something I think very important about art. He said art has two halves. One half is concerned with the um, uh, eternal, with the immutable, with permanence, and the other half is concerned with the transi tra what is transitory, circumstantial, ephemeral. And I, I agree with him. And uh, just just like a tree, a tree has the trunk, which is uh, you know has a certain level of permanence, but then you have in the spring the the leaves the, and then the flowers, which are ephemeral, and and you need both. And in terms of architecture, I would say we need both structure, meaning permanence to an extent, permanence and the ornament, which is a reference to what is ephemeral and even capricious. Just like a tree, again, has the trunk, the structure, which, you know, lasts even beyond the next winter, but then you have the ephemerality, sometimes the splendid ephemerality of the flowers in the spring and also the leaves, the foliage. I think uh, Baudelaire was right. Again, early works at the top and newer works at the bottom. And the new works now in the greatest museums of the world, uh, including uh, facing the sofa by Miss van der Rohe. Miss van der Rohe, who actually had a strange name, his name was actually not Miss van der Rohe. He changed his name into his mother's name. Rohe is his mother's name. Miss is his father's name, which actually means in uh, translated in English, lousy. But because he wanted his name to kind of sound, uh, um, you know, of a nobleman, he wanted to say, uh, to have his name Ludwig, uh, um, I mean, uh, Miss Van uh, Roche, uh, but but uh, Germany, the German uh, customs, or I don't know, uh, uh, didn't allow him to do that because he was not a nobleman. So then he chose the Dutch uh, form, which is Van der. So that's why his name, Miss Van der Roche, uh, uh, kind of strange, because it's almost a built-in contradiction in the name. You know, he was, uh, uh, he wanted the name to sound uh, like a nobleman, but then the first name which he received from his father means lousy. So it's almost like saying a lousy nobleman. It was a self-derogatory uh, linguistic gesture in the choice of his name. Strange. He has countless paintings like this. He was really searching for something. And maybe what he was searching for is what Rainer Maria Rilke, the great uh, uh, poet said that maybe the, the main challenge in life, the main test, the main uh, problem is to make peace between uh, men and women, you know? And here we have in a way that, we have the horizontal and the vertical in an interplay, in a dichotomy, in a dialectics. And, and, and here it is about the masculine principle and the feminine principle, and, the, and, and both exist within all of us in various percentages. In a way, he was searching for a wholeness, a kind of a yin and yang wholeness, but expressed through verticals and horizontals.
I would almost, I almost feel tempted now spontaneously uh, to say that they are his prayers, his pictorial prayers. He prayed through his paintings. That's it. I finished. <laughs> it lasted for uh, a little more than one hour, but uh, I finished. So now if you want, we can, uh, we can talk a little bit. Um, I am probably a little bit tired because after yesterday uh, it was uh, ah hello Bruce hello Florian well it's it's it's, it's a different hello hello Hi. Hi. Um, and Anka is here I am beginning to know some of these uh, of the, some of the people who are um, you know constant uh, presences at these um, presentations yesterday we had uh, almost one hundred people. Um, you know, but uh, that was because the speakers were had their friends and so on. And maybe tomorrow uh, more will come because uh, we'll talk about Antoni Gaudi and Alvaro Siza. Although I'm a little bit desperate, if I can say so, because I lost the PowerPoint presentation on Alvaro Siza. Fortunately, we'll have a, a young architect from Portugal will talk about uh, CISA. I could talk too, but I don't know if I can make another point, PowerPoint presentation by tomorrow. I have to find it. I have so many and I, I'm not very organized, so I lose some, some of them and it's terrible. <laughs> I don't know for how long I can continue to do this without, uh, you know, becoming ridiculous. You know, if I keep, uh, you know, announcing the celebrations and then I lose the PowerPoint presentations, I don't sleep at night trying to create new ones and new ones, and it's very difficult. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit, if you want. Bruce, uh, I hope you, you don't neglect your duties uh, for over hour. Uh, I still don't know if I pronounce well the name of, of, of your company. Uh, yeah, it's pronounced many different ways, Dan. Pardon? It's pronounced many different ways. Yeah, that's okay. That that offers me the chance to, you know. Uh, but how do you pronounce it, please? I just say Overup. Ah, uh, uh, you, you said it so beautifully. I don't think I can. I can repeat. When I was the in easy, a plane, the easy way to do it, Dan, is just to say Arab. So we shortened it to have less problems. Can, um. Can I share some thoughts on um, the Dutch style? Sure. So um, I was very obsessed with that for many years. And do you know this artist, Bart Vanderleck? No. Oh, it's beautiful, beautiful work. And there's the, the Kohler Mueller Museum in Otterloo. Yeah, near... that's one I showed today. Yeah, it's, it, there's some beautiful work of his there. Um, but besides that, um, you know, Van Doesburg, I, I'm not an expert, this, but this is my impression. Van Doesburg was a very controversial figure. And he, uh, there was JJP Oud, O-U-D. Yes, was uh, very living, interesting architect, yes. And he left the group because he was more interested, I think, in social issues and social housing. Yes. And maybe less less interested in art, um, but some of the collaborations were really fascinating between Van Doesburg and JJP Oud, in that Van Doesburg felt as a colorist that his job was to contradict the architecture, to oppose it, to really create something that was quite in opposite direction to the architecture, to and I think it was more just to to not only bring out the power of the colorist and not just be somebody who's painting a wall, but to create something new in the contradiction. And I I think he he was kind of I think his personality and, and I don't know, it's just my assumption was was abrasive to these people and, and they didn't want contradiction, they wanted harmony. Um, and I think I, I, I wasn't fully paying attention to the whole presentation, but I think you know, one of the things that I would emphasize in Van Doesburg work and certainly in um, Mondrian and Rietveld as well is this sense of the universal. So just 
um, restricting yourself to primary colors, uh, black and white, so red, yellow, blue, black and white, and creating uh, compositions that were not bound by the frame. So they would continue into sort of universal space and try to connect with universal beauty. So Dan, those are just a few thoughts I wanted to share with you on, on the Dutch style. Bruce, Bruce uh, now I understand, you know, why you studied uh, art history and you are an incredible art critic. You know, I'm joking, of course, because you have an excellent engineer, but it amazes me that, uh, you know, the, the, the accuracy of, of your uh, understanding of art. I, I truly think uh, you have the, the heart of a poet, if you allow me to say so, and an artist. I mean, you said in a few words, I think uh, works, uh, you said things that are, I think, very, very true. And uh, what, what can I say? I, I, I am impressed. <laughs> I am. You know, I mean, I don't know. Are there many engineers in the world who are so accurate in their understanding of, of, of art? I don't know. I, I, I hope there are, but I, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm actually skeptical. <laughs> Hello? Bruce, are you still here or you left? You are. No, I'm, I, I, I'm still here. It's, um, so I, you know, I, another, another point to make, Dan, is that um, I believe, and this might be a rumor or urban legend, but I believe that Frank Lloyd Wright did a trip to the Netherlands and came back with such a strong impression of the style, the Dutch style, and that Falling Water and some of his other compositions are very much um, inspired by the Dutch movement. It's possible. It's possible. But the Dutch also were influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright, from what I read. So who knows, maybe it's also a synchronicity of some sort or uh, some kind of uh, conjunction uh, between two sensibilities that are not, in their essence, maybe they are not so, uh, you know, uh, different from each other. I, I don't know. But uh, I don't know if you are here from the very beginning. Uh, the Dutch impressed me, you know, uh, they continue to, to, to amaze me, you know, even now there are incredible architects there and incredible artists, it's just incredible. I mean, you know, uh, how come this country is not so big? It's, you know, they had countless great artists you know, and architects. You just mentioned uh, old, and uh, I mean, uh, I think is, this country is, is unique. I, I call them, the, but maybe wrongly, the Japanese of Europe. I don't know exactly why. I I, I feel like because they are very experimental, and uh, I, I don't know. It's a unique country, I think. Anyway, I didn't say something too surprising now, but uh, I, uh, so anyone else wants to say something about uh, what we what we saw today, and, uh, you know, or maybe what we are going to see tomorrow, because tomorrow it is a, a, a big day. I mean, to talk about Gaudi, you know, uh, and then uh, you know, so Alvaro Cesar. I wrote a little invitational text, but I hesitated to send it because it's, you know, it's hard to talk in a few words about, you know, I mean, Gaudi was a giant, as you know, in architecture and uh, Alvaro Siza is an important architect today, still alive. Um, so anyway, um, Bruce, uh, since you are still here, uh, do you think you could join us at, at least for a few minutes on the 29th when we will talk about John Johansson? Dan, let's see, the 29th. 
I think I can join for, yes, yeah, I can do that. Thank you. I, I still have to, to prepare myself for John Johansson, uh, but uh, I think it's worthy to, to talk about him because he is not well known, uh, unfortunately, but I think he was an interesting architect and uh, I myself don't know enough about him, so I, I, I will... Start. Yeah, I just, I won't, I won't have the opportunity to do too much research and I'm, I'm too busy right now to give John his um, fair due. Yes, but you, you, you met him, you, you worked with him, so you don't need to make, do research. I'll do the research. Maybe you could just say a few things about him as a human being and, you know, for us, it's a chance to be with someone who who met him. I didn't meet him. I sure. met I met Levi Asuts, who met him, who met. The, I think wrote the foreword to his book Nano Architecture, Nano Texture, uh, which I didn't read. But uh, he was an interesting man. I'm sure you would uh, agree with this. Sure. So, um, so uh, you know. Um, Again, tomorrow we'll meet uh, to talk about Gaudi and, and Alvaro Siza. And I think there was another architect, but I, I, I can't find him. Also born or died on the 25th of June. I, I try to, you know, uh, Bruce, in, in, in our country, the, the church has a calendar with the saints. And there are so many saints, you know, every day is a different saint. So I, I thought of doing a similar uh, calendar but with artists and architects, you know, so on the 25th, we'll have Saint Gaudi. In his case, he might even be or almost a saint because, you know, he was proposed to be sanctified. And then, uh, you know, Alvaro Siza didn't yet make it to that level, but at least he he's, uh, you know, kind of a Pritzker saint. And uh, <laughs> today was Rydberg, uh, and uh, I don't know who will follow after after the 25th. Uh, Bruce, were you present yesterday? Did you attend at all yesterday? No, I couldn't, Dan. There were 100 people. I mean, you know, these Indonesians, of course, it's a big country. You know, they have 240 million people or something like this. No, no, but th th there were not just uh, um, Indonesians. Uh, there were also many other people because this this couple they build and because they build you know they they are you know more appealing to architects and students so um, dan I, I wanted to i wanted to make a recommendation to please. you maybe um try to do a little bit less give yourself a little bit more time <laughs> meaning to make them rare but but bruce how could i if today was, was rick bell's birthday how could I just skip him? <laughs> I mean, I can't. If your child, his or her birthday is today, you can't just say, you know, I'm giving myself some space. You know, I'll tell you happy birthday uh, the day after tomorrow. Or for me, it's, uh, it's, I understand what you are saying, but at the same time, for me, it is a way of, 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 of promoting these celebrations for important moments in. If I would not have done it today for Rydberg, I would have never done it probably. And also for the, you know, uh, the others that we did. So I understand what you say. And many people tell me, you know, you, you make them uh, too often and people, uh, you know, uh, yeah, but what can I do? People are not born in the same day. So uh, I'm joking a little bit, but I understand what you are saying and thank you for the suggestion. But I don't know, actually, because I hate my own birthday. I don't like it at all. But other people's birthdays, and I did this for a long time, believe me, I, 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 uh, I, I used to celebrate uh, other people's birthdays for years. I don't know why I do this. Maybe because I do believe in that carpe diem that you have to, to grasp the moment and, 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 you know, make all the efforts to not neglect a moment that has a certain importance in culture. Or of course, I cannot do it for everybody, but for architects at least, or, uh, you know, we did it for Peter Rice. Yes, not too many people showed up, but some did. And 
even that effort that that you know a few people talked about Peter Rice on his birthday. Uh, I think uh, I don't know. I, I like to think that Peter Rice, wherever he is now, he was uh, you know uh, he appreciated that. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a form of madness, Bruce. I'm sorry. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs>